Good evening, wonderful Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to RASC Toronto Centre. We are online tonight, and I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of RASC Toronto Centre. This is March 2022, can you believe it? And this is our Speakers Night presentation. This is one of two types of gatherings that we have online these days, not at the Ontario Science Centre due to the pandemic. Our president, Tom Luton, will later on be talking about various programs this evening. But first, of course, uh, per usual with our speakers night, we have a special kickoff. So to get us started, I'd like to take a second to acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. These lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Matisse, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. As we engage in astronomy here tonight, together, we respect, learn from, and honour the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and earth. Uh, so for our speakers night tonight, we actually get to join up not with uh, not just with Earth, but with Mars. And I'm really delighted to get to welcome Shamira Andres, a Master's of Science uh, extraordinaire, planetary geophysicist and current PhD student at York University. She is also a science communicator. So let me go ahead and see if I can get on with the introduction here, tying this all, all together. So Shamira Andres is a very wonderful uh, uh, sort of catch, if you will. She's going to breach some very chill topics, if I don't say so myself. In fact, she researches the movement of ice in glacial and periglacial environments using ground penetrating radar, LIDAR, um, and high power lasers. Now, LIDAR in particular has a special uh, connection back to York, where she's from, because of course, uh, LIDAR um, being uh, sort of initiated by Ellen I. Kurzweil, whose name is actually on the Ellen I. Kurzweil Observatory back at York, and full uh, full uh, circle complete, <laughs> Shamira is using this now to investigate the uh, the chilly ices of uh, of Mars. She's also done radar remote sensing in the Canadian high Arctic, so very extreme environments, and uses these cold high alpine environments on Earth as kind of a, a comparison or a planetary analog, if you will, to cold environments on Mars for future scientific and technological developments. And of course, one of my, my favorite topics, uh, humans on Mars. <laughs> so um, very near and dear to my to my own heart. So currently, Shamira is the uh, president for the students uh, um, for the exploration of space, or SEDS, which some of you might even remember. Um, they've been around for a while. So SEDS Canada is a wonderful uh, organization, and she's also an advocate for science technology science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, or STEAM as it's called. So she just recently finished a one-year term working for ESA uh, STEC in the Netherlands, or the European Space Agency, as part of the Earth Observation Space Technology and Environmental Sciences uh, team. So they have an ESA education team over there. And uh, for one, I am very interested to not take too much longer with this introduction and get to hear the pros and cons of this cool topic. So without any further ado, um, please... Shamira, take it and us away. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Elena, for that amazing introduction. So as Elena had mentioned, and I, my name is Shamira Andres, and I'm a PhD student at York University. It's such a privilege. And I'm so lucky to be part of this Speakers Night event. And I just wanted to thank Raf Toronto and the, coll the colleagues there and the team for their support in helping set this up. But today I hope to familiarize you with one of my favorite topics on Mars, not just because it's my research for my PhD, but also because I really believe that this is the most valuable treasure that we have on Mars, which for me is ice. And some people it's rocks, <laughs> some people it's other things, but this is a new gold for me, I think. Um, but just because um, I like Mars doesn't mean I haven't done other research. I actually started studying Earth first 
And that's what really hooked me into getting into interested in space and into Mars. So that's why I went into the European Space Agency. I worked with the Earth Observation Education team there. And that really sparked more of my interest in space education and also science communication. Um, but just like as, as Elaine just said, I also i am a PhD student. So I came back to Canada because I really miss the research and I really miss learning. Um, technically, I'm in grade 19, if you're counting in elementary school or if you're in high school. Um, I love school and I love learning more and more about space, about Earth, and about what interests me. And um, I hope that really resonates with some of you. These are just some pictures that I have here of some of my hobbies and some of the field sites that I got to go to being a geology and geophysicist, ma uh, geophysics major. Um, but as mentioned also, if you would like to be part of SEDS Canada, if you are a student, um, you can visit our website at SEDS.ca for more information or feel free to contact me. Um, but aside from Mars and Earth, I also have been lucky to be part of some satellite missions and also mission planning, actually, of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter um, or of the high resolution science camera there. Um, so we got to image Mars and we got to pick targets on the planet. And this is part of my master's at Western University in London, Ontario. I also got to be a part of some CubeSat missions, uh, which have yet to be deployed. I really love Mars, but I also really love the moon and Pluto because there's ice there. <laughs> so anywhere there's ice in the a solar system or in the universe I really am in, really interested in but I have done field work in the Arctic and I also really love glaciers and permafrost so uh, just a fun fact also is that I love dance I've been dancing since I was four years old and I'm still trying to do it as well as a contemporary ballet artist freelancer here in Toronto so if you are an artist too and if you have a, an art form that you really love but you really also love engineering or science or math or you like to code, then for sure, why not both? Why can't you do both of the things that you're passionate about? So this is just a little bit about me, an introduction, but enough about me and let's go to Mars. So if you are familiar with Mars right now, and this picture right now, it gives me the chills still. So this is a selfie of the Perseverance rover. And if you can see the little companion on the left side here of the image, that's Ingenuity. And that's the help the helicopter the first flight that we had on Mars. So I really like this selfie because not just just not not just because it's a selfie from a robot from another planet, you know, um, but just because also this flight ingenuity had it was only supposed to be five flights that it's supposed to have. But now recently, I think just a week or two ago, it finished its 21st flight on the Mars on the red planet. So that speaks volumes to what we as humans can do. And even though it was just supposed to be a demonstration for technology, it will probably guide us and it will actually, liter quite literally, lead Perseverance, the rover, into its next traverses onto the Jezero crater delta. So that will be really, really valuable photos and information. And we're, I'm really excited to see how that goes. And today, I hope to familiarize you also with some of the research that I do. And in particular, that's on the subsurface and surface ice on Mars. So if you can tell by this image, this is actually the North Pole of Mars, and this is the North Polar Layer Deposit. So Mars has two ice caps. It has one in the north, one in the south. And if you haven't seen an image of it, this is quite literally what it looks like. So this is taken by the high rise high resolution science experiment camera. And the highlighted blues here are just a color, contra a color contrast or a filter. But these are actually highlighting the layers of ice and dust that are there. So it's made of water ice. It's made of carbon dioxide ice or dry ice. And it's also made of dust layers. And this actually is really important when you're studying not just Mars, but another planet like Earth. Similar to the Antarctic glaciers, it records the climate of the entire planet from billions and billions and billions of years. So this is quite old. But Mars ice has is quite old, but it just also has a very recent history. Because earlier on in the late 90s, Hubble Space Telescope pointed its camera on Mars and actually discovered this huge white circular object there and what was thought to be just clouds. So we looked at that and we saw, oh, it's probably just clouds on Mars, you know, in the North Pole. But actually they later found out that this cloud receded or shrunk and then it grew and then it shrunk and then it grew. So that's not a cloud <laughs> if it does that every single year. So that told us that Mars has seasons. So they discovered the North Polar Cap and ever since then there's been tons of research on 
um, the spiral troughs on the North Polar Deposit, some record of the climate and what it means, and even seeing through radar waves through that. So one fun fact that I wanted to ask the audience is, you can put it in the chat on YouTube as well, and but I'll be discussing the answers right away afterwards in the next slide. But if anyone, if we have seasons on Mars, then how long is a Martian day, uh, which is one soul? Right now, I can give you a clue that it's springtime on Mars. So Mars also has four seasons like Earth. So we have spring, summer, winter, and fall. So what season is it on Mars and how long is a Martian day? So if you can have a few guesses, maybe in just your brain, or if you want to type it in the chat, we'll get back to that. So with that number of how long a Martian day is, can you calculate how long a Martian year would be? Any guesses? Any guesses? So it can be a very high number. It can be very similar to Earth, maybe. It can be very far from Earth. There are no correct and wrong answers at the moment. But I really love Mars, not just because it's our neighboring planet, but because it has a lot of things in common with Earth. So, and a lot of differences too, you know? So for example, Mars is literally half the size of Earth in diameter. So even though we see it from afar and we see this planet, red planet, it looks like Earth, it maybe looked like Earth before, it actually is quite small and smaller than Earth was. And a fun fact, it has two moons as well. So Deimos and Phobos, and they actually are really, really cool as well. And there's a few missions being proposed to go to those moons because they've never been explored Two moons on Mars. And Mars is a, quite a special place, even though it's really cold, <laughs> negative 55 and a low of negative 133 degrees. It has the highest high and the lowest lows in all of our solar system. So we have Olympus Mons, which is the largest volcano in the entire solar system. And we also have Valles Marineris, which you've probably seen on the Martian surface. It's just like a straight streak across. And that is literally a canyon in the middle of Mars. And that's the deepest canyon and the lowest valley that we have in the solar system. So to answer your question, our question before, so a Martian day is actually very similar to a Earth Day, it's 24 hours and 37 minutes. So not that big of a difference. So if you're working on a Martian mission, this might be a little bit annoying because you have to follow the Martian day and push 37 minutes, 37 minutes, 37 minutes into your mission planning. But a Martian year, quite if you calculate it, kind of doubles, you know, in Earth days. So it's 687 Earth days is a Martian year. So every two years, I don't know if you've noticed, that's kind of the height of Mars mission um, deployments because we have a specific window that we want to hit every time we want to launch something to Mars. And that two years is one of the ideal timelines to launch that. I won't be talking about the rest of the fun facts here, but feel free to take a glance at them very quickly. There's a lot of cool information that Mars has, but I also want to talk a little bit about Earth. So Mars has had several missions throughout the past, since the 1960s. So there's been around 50, or definitely more now, missions to Mars since the 1960s. And the 19, 1960s was when the space boom kind of happened. So we wanted to go to the moon, we wanted to explore the planets, we wanted to go to low Earth orbit. So there's a lot of different things happening then, but for Mars, it was quite a unique spot because that was further into the solar system that we wanted to plant up to send humans to. But unfortunately, it's really difficult to send something to another planet. So there's been 50% success rate in doing so. And I just wanted to point your attention to these four points here. Uh, these are the different types of missions that go to Mars. And one is a flyby, one is an orbiter, one is a lander, and one is a rover. So not just to Mars, sorry, but to any other planetary body. So as you can see in this very busy graph, there's been a lot of those types of missions that landed on the surface, successfully and unsuccessfully. But currently, there's 12 active, active missions on Mars right now, on the red planet. So we have one lander, which is InSight from NASA. We have three rovers right now roving around Mars. We have Curiosity from NASA, Perseverance from NASA, and Zurong rover from the Chinese Space Agency. We also have another rover going there, making its way soon enough uh, in September 2022. So keep your eye out, eye out on that. It's, it's the European Space Agency's ExoMars rover. Um, and it's actually called uh, Rosalind Franklin, uh, named after Rosalind, Fra Rosalind Franklin. And we also have eight active orbiter satellites there. So there's a lot of data 
um, going around Mars. And the most important thing that I wanted to point out is these active missions actually help each other out. So these orbital satellite satellites, they, they get used to communicate back to Earth and to bounce back information faster and to help other rovers, help other landers communicate to each other. So it's not just a single orbiter doing its own individual mission. So we're all working together to bring back data from Mars to Earth because it does take 11 minutes to do a to talk to a satellite on Mars. So by the time it gets to Earth, you really want that to be really efficient and quite fast. So one of the fun facts I wanted to highlight because Canada has actually contributed to Mars exploration, uh, but I wanted to highlight one of the first ones because it's very close to my heart as uh, Dr. Hyde um, has mentioned. So I at York University, we had this amazing mission that professors had designed, students were part of, and that is called the Phoenix Lander. It was launched in May 25th, 2008, and then arrived on Mars on November 2nd, 2008. So the target landing site was the North Pole of Mars, and what's in the North Pole of Mars? I wonder what, what? So to be, to be just like, fa to just fast forward into the landing of this Phoenix Lander, it landed on the surface of Mars and it made history because it was the first to actually touch and sample water on Mars. So if you actually were to guess, maybe on the chat or just amongst yourself, which instrument in this rover, you can just kind of point or pick your favorite instrument there that you see, which instrument was invented by Canada or contributed by Canada to this mission. I will give you maybe three seconds <laughs> to pick your favorite instrument while Phoenix unfolds its solar panels. So if you guessed this green laser coming out, that you are actually correct. So the meteorological station or the weather station was contributed by Canada, which had the LIDAR system as well. And that actually told us the weather. So leave it to the Canadians to discover that there's snow on Mars on another planet, right? How typical of us. But I really love studying Earth and Mars because, like I said before, they have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences too. And here's Marsh, uh, Marvin the Martian telling you so. Uh, these are some of the differences, but we won't focus on those. But there's a lot of things that are similar as well. I'm going to focus more on the geophysical and geological processes. So like impact craters, volcanoes, gullies, and cliffs that are on Mars that also appear on Earth. But more importantly, there's ice in both planets. And, and, and ice, to researchers like myself, is a treasure to find. So one of the techniques as a research, researcher that I use is called ground penetrating radar. And this is what we see. So a ground penetrating radar essentially stands for GPR, uh, the acronym GPR. And it's a non-invasive geophysical technique that allows you to image the surface and look at the layers of stratigraphy. And that allows you to kind of see the history of the planet and what has been done in the past, in the first few meters. So depending on what frequency that you use, you can actually interpret a little bit of what you see. So like, for example, this X right here is actually ice. So this is taken in the Canadian high Arctic. So this was not taken on Mars. And this was taken by me <laughs> manually walking across a grid. Uh, and so what I would do is pull this ground penetrating radar. So this is a monostatic antenna, 250 megahertz GPR. And we took this data set and collected it and discovered that there are some patches of ice. And so we wanted to model this further and kind of calculate the math and the dielectric constants of the material because every layer has a different dielectric constant. So after you've co corrected for the topography, because obviously no, per no surface is perfectly flat, we were able to actually see different trends in the topography and also how that follows where the ice is. So this is labeled polygon A and polygon B because a polygon is like a ridge and it goes down into a little valley and then it goes up again. And polygons are like honeycomb figures that actually show you sometimes that there's subsurface ice there because it's where permafrost lies. So we wanted to image the permafrost table and maybe see if this can apply to Mars. So this is the interpretation of that data set after doing a lot of math and data correction. But a special fact about GPR is there's actually a GPR on Mars right now and it's actually on the Perseverance rover. Uh, on Jezero Crater. So they're going to be seeing the stratigraphy of Mars in that crater in the delta and seeing the history of that 
delta and the fluvial deposit deposits um, that are under there. And there's also another GPR coming along with ExoMars or the Rosalind Franklin rover. And that one is specifically supposed to image the subsurface ice. So you can do a lot of different things with the data. You can even model it in 3D, which is what we did. So this is a crystal lattice that we modeled. And you can actually see that ice is not uniform. So even though we think permafrost, oh, it's probably just a sheet of ice under soil and rock. No, sometimes it's actually very, very different. So sometimes it preferentially goes into something low. Sometimes it appears on something high. So why that happens, we're trying to investigate that. So in this little 25 by 25 meter grid that we imaged, we were able to cal calculate only 43 me um, cubic meters of ice. So that's really important, especially when you're trying to send humans to Mars because you want to know where the ice is because we want to, where there's ice, there's water, and you can use that as a resource, which we'll talk about later on. But just as a fun, fun video showing, I just wanted to show you what it is like to do field work in the Arctic. Um, just to look at planetary analogs, look at, we went to a crater in the Canadian high Arctic that it, that excavated permafrost as well. Um, and we went to another island called Axel Heiberg Island. And that's where we also collected a lot of ground penetrating radar data and a lot of samples for sediment analysis. Um, that is a twin otter where we have to load all of our equipment. It only fits like eight people <laughs> inside. We were a team of six. Um, and we stayed at the Polar Continental Shelf, which is shown here, and we landed back into our um, base camp. We flew drone and collected data from that. We also had a LIDAR that we collected data from, which is a light detection and ranging instrument that collects data from a distance. So you can get that data from that. And this is just good old fun camping. And also being a researcher is fun because I get my outside is my laboratory. So that's what I really love about my field as well is the people that you get to work with and nature that you get to collect your data at. So I'm very lucky to and privileged to be part of that. But why it matters to me a lot. But why should this matter to you? Uh, because if you were to guess for planetary analogs, we use them as a ref we use Earth as a reference reference point to Mars. So if you were to guess which of these images is actually Earth and which is Mars, which would you pick? So again, um, I want this to be really interactive. So in the chat, if you could put your guesses too, is A Earth, is B Earth, is A Mars, is B Mars? So put your guesses down. I'll give you maybe 10 more seconds to guess and I'll reveal the answer very quickly. Uh, there is no wrong guesses. This is just for question. Actually, it's not a trick question, but it's meant to kind of hint at that. But OK, I'll give you three more seconds. And I'm going to reveal the answer now to you. And if you guess that A is Mars and B is Earth, then you are correct. So this is taken in Hill Crater, and this is in Svalbard, Norway. And these landforms are called gullies. So gullies are usually formed with the erosion of water from a higher slope and then going down slope in topography, but also we found that studies show that it can also be formed with ice sublimation. So from ice solid turning into a gas, gaseous phase. So essentially we see these on Mars, especially in the side of craters, but we see them also on the high and mid latitudes of Mars. And this is associated with some sort of erosion or some sort of sublimation because water is really not stable on the surface of Mars. So it, it just quickly disappears. So what could be forming these gullies if it's not water? So that's one of the questions that we are trying to answer as well. And these are just some images to show you what the surface of Mars looks like. It's very diverse, uh, not like what you think. We see these on Earth too sometimes, but you just in different forms. So to label them, the one on the left that you see here is actually the surface of a glacier on Mars that I'm studying. And the one on the right is are actually dunes that are T-shaped. And we actually named them Tea Party because they're T-shaped dunes. This is the inside of a crater. So we have a lot of craters here on Earth, too. We have some in Germany. We have the Chicxulub down in Mexico. We have a lot in Canada as well and a few more around the world. So we have access to these, especially on our planet. So we're using our planet to compare to another planet, even though it's not a one to one. 
it really does help, especially when you're trying to only look at pictures of another planet and you can't actually be there in person, you know, to see it yourself which is another reason why we want to study these images to be able to send humans to another planet because you don't want to just send them there without knowing anything. But what are we really looking for when we say, oh, astrobiology and life on another planet, is it possible to have life on Mars? So I just wanted to go over that there are different types of forms of life, uh, like life as we know it on Earth may be different. So there are different types of extremophiles that can exist and thrive in environments that we as humans might find survival challenging. So for example, an extreme temperature and extreme salinity and extreme pH levels. So on Mars, especially when there's cold and dry and high UV radiation, there's many different types of extremophilic life that you can actually see. So we haven't found them, but there's extreme salinity on Mars, which can cause halophiles to thrive. There's also extreme cold environments on Mars, which can cause cryoph cryophiles to live. Um, so these are just images of, this is a cryophile, this is discovered under the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, and this is a halophile, so it, it's salt, it really loves salty things, but there's one thing in common with all of this and life as we know it, because there's a missing ingredient and there's a key ingredient for life, life as we know it, and that is liquid water. So that's why I'm really motivated to observe and investigate where ice is, because if there's water ice in another planet like Mars, then there could be water underneath the surface. So where is this water ice that we speak of on Mars? So this is just an example of some of them, but not all of them. Uh, there's current missions that are being planned and missions right now that are helping plan other missions to especially look at this. So subsurface ice and surface ice is where you can find a lot of ice on Mars. But we just don't know how much really. So we want to really streamline that so that we can actually have a constraint of how much ice there is. So there is hypo I hypothesized water ice in, underneath Val Valles Marineris. There's some also ice found in the southern ice cap, obviously, and also in the north. There's some water ice also in Utopia Planitia. And there's also water ice in Flegramontes, which is my favorite place on Mars right now because that's where I'm doing my PhD on. Not physically, but you know, <laughs> remotely, um, remo remotely working from Earth. So, Phlegramontes is one of the candidate human landing sites actually on Mars. And that's because it's very ice rich. So, it has a lot of icy and ice rich flows going down the mountains. And you might see, you might think, oh, it's just a little sliver over there in the corner, but it's a very, very interesting place, which I'll show you why first. So I just wanted to also, just a side note, it's really important for resource, institute resource utilization or ISRU, especially because we really need water, which has H2O, and we need the oxygen from that. So an example of how we utilize oxygen from the Martian atmosphere or Mars in general, which maybe we can do in the surf from the surface next moving forward, is on April 21, an instrument on the rover called MOXIE, actually produced five grams of oxygen, which is 10 minutes worth of breathing time for an astronaut. And they use the atmosphere of Mars, harvesting carbon dioxide and utilizing the O2 and isolating that, and then creating essentially oxygen on another world, which is the first of its kind to do anything like this. And so essentially this kind of technology can help future missions live off, live off of the land especially if we go to the moon it's in lunar gateway missions and then further on to mars if we're sending humans to another planet so this type of instrument should be also utilized for surface um resource utilization you know so instead of just the atmosphere can we create an instrument also that harvests the ice and oxygen from the ice so that's for future thinking and just kind of food for thought but really what i'm studying is the martian ice history or the cryosphere the ice system on mars which is the region of the crust where the temperature remains so so cold and so low that even even though it's so low there's still dynamic glaciers flowing down and also subsurface permafrost that are changing the landforms all over so on this graph that you see here on the right it's essentially showing you depending on how wide the shapes are that means that that's the rate of the of their formation and this is the geologic timeline of mars so if you're aware of the geologic timeline of earth it's a little bit similarly modeled so ga is giga annum and that stands for billions of years so if you can already tell 
there's some gr already defined landforms that you know that formed we know oh late amazonian okay and these landforms are well defined okay they formed in the early Nawakian Hesperian region of the Martian geologic timeline. But if you look in the middle, there's a huge gap where there's just question marks <laughs> because no one knows what and when things formed in that region. And that's the mid and early M M Amazonian. And so that's what I also want to investigate because if the glaciers here and the lobate debris aprons, which are essentially Piedmont glaciers that you see on earth and the polar ice cap, that the polar layered terrains also formed later then, then could they have formed earlier if the ice is older indeed on Mars? So the timeline that we're trying to constrain the mid-latitude glaciation on Mars could be 10 to hundreds of millions of years. And this is really difficult to constrain with just landforms. So we really want to be able to collect data, especially where the ice is and how much there is. And maybe we can actually characterize those layers that we see um, below the surface if we do send instruments there or a future human exploration mission there. So this is an example of what the Martian landscape would be in an, the icy region of Phlegramontes, which is shown here on the right. So that mountain range is actually a curved spine or, or a massif. And essentially it's from high topography to low topography, there's a lot of glaciers and ice just flowing downhill. And there's also a lot of ice trapped underneath the surface. So that middle point where they meet is what I'm really interested in. So the surface and the subsurface ice, is it truly a boundary or is it a continuum where they can actually interact with each other um, and connect and feed each other? Uh, so how does this influence the Martian water ice cycle, you know, if there is any? So we want to calculate the water budget on Mars and especially using this mountain range as a case study for that. So we look at a lot of pictures of Mars. And these are really, really weird, awesome pictures of Mars that I look at a lot. Um, there's more, but these are just a few examples that I pick. And I categorized the ice, essentially, the icy, ice-rich landforms on Mars um, to have three distinct groups. So one is glacial, uh, which is termed icy. One is periglacial, which is permafrost, essentially, which is ice-rich, and then mixed, where they two interact and they're found in the same areas. So for example, these blue ones are viscous flow features or glacier-like forms. So you can see that this is a glacier flowing down the slope, and this is the surface of an actual uh, lobate debris apron, which is another term for a glacier on Mars. And we also have subsurface ice deposits that have different textures, very different. So we have some domes, uh, which are called large pitted mounds. We have scalloped topography, which essentially are kind of like digs and the surface kind of caved in with negative relief. We have pitted um, textures and we also have polygons that we I showed you the ground penetrating radar image of before. So these different environments interact with each other. So I put question marks on them because we don't know yet if it truly is periglacial or permafrost related or not. And we also have these other ones that you see in both environments. So either with a glacier and with subsurface ice. So we're trying to figure out where these all occur and where they belong. And that's why we create maps to find the ice. So let's do that. So these are just some of the preliminary findings in my research on Phlegramontes. So this is kind of a grid that, that I overlaid on top of it. And we start with a weighted geomorphology map, with, which essentially was already done for us. It's available from the SWIM team's data. So SWIM stands for Subsurface Water Ice Mapping. And that's a project that was funded by NASA. And they were actually able to delineate where the ice is on Mars. And this is just a little patchy um, map that they created. And they looked at eight different landform groups. And they said, oh, this has a lot of ice in it. So it gets a lot of a higher weighting. And this doesn't get a lot of ice in it, so it gets a lower rating. So the areas where it's lightest, so white, light gray, that means that there is high likelihood that there is ice in those regions. So we go further and kind of do like a binary categorization of that. And we look at where ice is dominant. So I just want to draw your attention to the very dark pink blocks that you see. And that's where ice is really, really 100% dominant and then yellow where it's possible and the pink where it is present. And the ones that are unshaded, obviously 
there is the absence of ice. And this is a really interesting photo as well, because this is the radar surface power return. So radar is a really cool remote sensing technique. Essentially, it's like bouncing a ball. So it's active. Uh, it's like active remote sensing. So you bounce the ball and you pick up the signal again. So depending on the time that the signal travels back, it gives you a lot of information about what you're looking at. So this radar, which is called SHARAD, so the shallow um, radar detection, <laughs> there's a lot of acronyms. Uh, so that's the instrument that was used here, but also the data is available from the SWIM team or subsurface water ice mapping teams project. And where there is blue, you can actually see that there's a little, there's patchy parts of low ice, low ice consistency, and then where it's high, that's where you actually see a lot of the ice. So it's correspondent to each. So the darker the pixels are, that's kind of where the ice is concentrated. And then we second to the last, we actually played with the elevation maps and data of Mars on that region of the mountains, and we actually tried to see where would the glaciers flow, where would the ice accumulate or be deposited if we were to create a drainage map or a catchment. So on Earth, we would create this for rivers or the Andes, uh, the Patagonia. If the glaciers were melting, obviously on Mars, they would not be melting because water is not stable on the surface. But if you had glaciers flowing down this mountain range, where would they situate themselves? And these little drainage basins on Mars are hypothetical, but they actually can show you different patterns which are concentrated in different regions. So we categorize those, especially the bigger ones here in the middle which can actually show you some trends later on about how ice situates itself or flows downhill. And then finally, we created this other cool map. Um, and this essentially categorizes all the land systems that we created before. So is it glacial or icy? Is it paraglacial or ice rich? And is it mixed? But the regions I'm really interested in is where it goes from dark blue yellow to blue, light blue, because that's the actual transition from an icy glacier into, and we don't know, mixed, and then into the permafrost and, or periglacial subsurface ice. So that's a really interesting dichotomy boundary that we want to figure out and study even more. And as a case study, this is a section of that mountain range that I just cut, and it's around 40 degrees latitude if you are looking at a map of Mars. And this, believe it or not, is a glacier flowing downhill. And downhill is going northwest of this page, so up to the left. So towards the zone of ablation is where the glacier kind of retreats and has a lot of sublimation because it's going down flow and it's sublimating the quickest. And then the zone of accumulation is typically where snow falls and everything accumulates pushing down with the weight of the glacier down uh, following topography. So if you can just take note of these little patterns that are happening on the ground, these are some of the weird landforms that we were seeing earlier, but they're occurring on the same spot. So we just wanted to figure out and map these more in detail because you can see that this is a crater that was overflown and covered with, imprinted with a lot of periglacial landforms. And we have the viscous flow feature, which is the VFS, which is just undulating and mixing with other surface features that are usually periglacial, not glacial in form. And then on the top, what's really weird is you see these polygons, and this is a sharp, sharp boundary where you can actually see maybe some ice rich features as well, but we don't know. So these landforms are really interesting because we want to map them. We want to look at their geometry, we want to look at their shapes and their elongation ratio ratios and see if we can do any analysis on them that shows us any more data that we can tell about the glacier and how the ice is shaping the landscape and carving the landscape out. So that's really important because especially if we send humans to Mars, it's important. I just wanted to show this as a fun space fact. If you didn't know, there is a planetary protection law or the Outer Space Treaty. And one of the things here that it highlights I'm just going to leave all of this so you can read, but is the last one. States that, sh um, so the Planetary Protection or Outer Space Treaty uh, states that we shall avoid harmful contamination of space and celestial bodies. So that's an important part of human exploration missions and missions in general, because if you go to another planet, especially another planetary body or an asteroid, for example, this is one of the priorities that we don't want to do. So we can't just go to a planet and then dig 
for the purpose of digging, just because for fun. And we can't leave stuff behind. So it's kind of like the leave no trace motto. Um, and essentially, I just wanted to leave with this because although space is an international collaboration, we are all still individually responsible for that. And we want to hold everyone accountable who is using space uh, as for peaceful, peaceful purposes for exploration for mankind, right? Um, and just to quickly summarize, there's a lot of things that will be happening next in Martian exploration. So we wanted to, first, I wanted to essentially highlight the human essentials, why we want to go to another planet, because we want to identify water ice resources, because ice really is our life support. It's our rocket fuel. It's our way back home. We're not going to another planet on a one-way mission. So we want to bring the astronauts that we're sending there back. And to go to Mars, it almost takes around nine months to travel there in um, just one way. So if we're sending astronauts to another planet to do that, we need good conditions for them and good knowledge on and background and information on that planet as well. So we want to already be able to characterize the terrain that we're going to because whatever you see on an image is very different than what you what you see when you land there. So essentially, we want to make sure that we have rocket fuel, which water ice is really useful for. We have life support that can have oxygen oxygen um, on the Martian surface for astronauts to breathe and to use as a resource. We also want to be able to access this ice or this water so that we can live longer and have something to drink or eat, uh, use for food. But this is essentially useful for the sustainable exploration and having habitats and launch pads in another planet. So rather than just focusing on the human essentials, this also advances our science. So that's why it's really important. And I really love being able to talk about it because planning for human exploration, especially if we're aiming for the mid 2030s, as we are now for the moon as well in the 2020, late 2020s, um, we require a lot of knowledge. That's not just a very easy task. You know, there is a 50% failure rate, but that was also because it was way, way back then. So if you look at the actual distribution of the successes, it's growing. So that's positive. But we also want to characterize how much water is there and where is there water. So have we kind of answered that in our research? So I wanted to again hone in to the fact that we do know where ice is on mars it is dominant in the first around 10 meters of the subsurface but it can be much much deeper we don't know so we have instruments that are able to tell us how that go really really far but we don't have instruments that can tell us the first few meters on the martian surface and that's what we need right now on mars it's a ground penetrating radar. <laughs> and we also know that they occur a lot on the mid to high latitude regions. And that's where ice is concentrated just because of the Martian obliquity cycles and also how Mars rotates. And, and so that's really important. However, do we know really how much ice there is on the red planet? Um, the short answer for this is we do. We have an estimate, we have a lot a lot of projects that are working on it, a lot of different localities that are being estimated, but it's not 100% accurate. We, we cannot give you a full 100% map volume of Mars because we just simply don't have the data set and the resolution to see that. So that's why we have missions such as the International Mars Ice Mission, um, International Mars Ice Mapper Mission, because this is an international collaboration, like I said earlier, and this is a really interesting proposal uh, mission. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, its goal is to map ground ice as a resource for essentially humans and further exploration and to be sustainable in another planet. So we want to use ground ice for all these wonderful things, but we also want to know about the science and how ice is distributed. And is there any reservoirs of ice? And is there, where does it come from? To look at the climate, was Earth and Mars as similar as we think? Was it not? Was Mars a previous type of Earth um, like planet? We don't know. So we want to look at the past of Mars so that we can understand the present and so that we can also plan for the future of human exploration on the red planet using geophysics and uh, geology and a lot of science. But 
we should have been on Mars by now, as Chris Hadfield, uh, Canadian astronaut, had mentioned. And I just wanted to leave the floor to any questions. And if you have any questions for me personally, I can answer them as well through social media or email. Uh, but let me know. And in the chat, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Sorry, what that was a great really talk. fast. <laughs> No worries. No worries. That was a great talk, Shamira. I think uh, I'll have to just go ahead and um, thank you all for giving the, us this uh, sort of snowing endorsement of Martian ice. Looking at Earth as an analog is a really amazing adventure, and it's just been so much fun following along with you. The MOXIE experiment in particular, I think, is a, sort of an, uh, if you will, <laughs> pardon the, the pun, an ice up your sleeve for future human habitation. Really fun stuff. Now we do have some questions I believe coming your way so I'm going to take this opportunity to say um, thank you very much to our speaker and pass over to Emma for questions from YouTube. So take it away Emma. Hi. Um, yeah so first question. Um, you mentioned SEDS Canada. Are you involved in the CAN ARX project um, and if so are you going on the trip? <laughs> yes yeah, so I'm actually one of the well, as president, you get to be part of a whole different uh, suite and portfolio of projects. But my favorite one, you better know that I'll be part of that, is the Canadian Arctic Research Expedition. Um, so right now we have two teams selected um, and they have di very different projects. One is space medicine related and one is rover engineering related. So we want to be able to go to the Canadian Arctic uh, and it's very outreach heavy as well. I don't know if I'll be going with them, but I hope I can, uh, funding permitted. So we're still trying to narrow down kind of the site that we want to go to, if that is just subarctic or high Arctic, anywhere really in the Arctic where it's remote. So the purpose of the whole project is to actually test field skills and also, you know, analog skills, not just for planets, but for health related issues and problems that science problems that we have here on Earth that may be tackled by astronauts later on in another planet. So yeah, we're happy to announce that there's two teams already selected and I wish, hope I can go, but there are project managers for our specific projects. So it's not like I'm in charge of everything and I can just go. So the, um, the team is very capable and I leave the trust in their hands. So I hope that explains it. But it's we're in our inaugural year. So this is the first time that we're actually launching and we're partnered with um, the Space Generation Advisory Council and also the University of Western Ontario, so, and Astraeus, which is a health nutri space nutrition company as well. Yeah. That's great. Um, this second question is about um, the grid maps. Um, yeah. So in the grid maps, there's some really sharp lines, like especially in the second one. Is this because um, that's just kind of how the data panned out? Or is it because, yes. um, say, some of it was taken on one day and some was taken on another? And so... <laughs> no, <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, that's just the resolution of the camera. So because it was so sharp, um, that's taken by the context camera on, on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So it has a very... It's not like the high resolution image that I showed you earlier, like the very, the tea part, the tea party one or the surface of the glacier. So it's a very coarse image. So that's why they just use that because it's wildly available for all of Mars because we don't unfortunately have coverage for the entire planet in high resolution, but we plan that would be very data heavy. So that's why we use CTX for context. Um, and that's why there's a very sharp contact there. So it might as well really be like a continuum if I were um, to, to map it out more in detail. But yeah, that's just the preliminary kind of finding that we had uh, for those grid maps. So I hope to further like go into like a square and each of the individual squares and actually refine all of the mapping based on whatever landform or radar data I provide. Great. Thank you. Um, next question. If we suppose that life had never existed on Mars, uh, why not? Why Earth and not Mars? Um, I, so I, I, I ask this question to myself all the time. I feel like astronomers and astrophysicists are also dumbfounded by this question because, I mean, Earth and Mars are just another planet. 
in the solar system, but there's several stars with exoplanets everywhere. So there, it's not just it's the short answer is why not? Why not another planet as well? So Mars is just our close neighbor, which is why we have so much information on it. But even with that information, we still don't know. Um, but and that's a really interesting question because for me, I'm really intrigued by exoplanets as well because we all the focus is on Mars, 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 and Moon, Moon, Moon. But there is so much out there in the galaxy that we have not even touched or we haven't even imaged. So I'm really excited. This is a side um, shout out to JWST because it will discover more of those Earth-like planets, I hope, and more similar ones that could be Mars-like, could be Earth-like, but life on another planet could very well exist. I we, do, we just don't know. So that's why we have so much history to kind of study. And right now we have only Mars. <laughs> Uh, well, great. Thank you. Um, it looks like that's all our questions for tonight. Uh, so thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll just come, hop back in and say once again, thank you very, very much to our speaker, uh, Shamira. I think uh, I speak for probably several of us that we could probably stay here quite a while talking about Mars and Mars ice and, well, the Phoenix Lander, among other things. <laughs> but unfortunately, we do have to wrap up tonight. So I hope you've all had a uh, as cool of a time as I have. This has been really fun. And I'll just uh, take this time to hand over to the president of the RAF Toronto Center, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. So take it away, Tom. All right. Well, thank you very much, Elena. Thank you very much to our speaker. And uh, good evening, everybody. So let's get these announcements underway. So as Elena was saying earlier, we've got two types of meetings here online on YouTube. We've just had one of our speaker nights, and in two weeks' time, we're going to have one of our recreational astronomy nights. Um, if you're watching this live on YouTube, please say hello in the chat. Uh, enter some questions for presenters like uh, some other folks have already done this evening. If you're a new member, please introduce yourself on the chat. And if you're visiting us from far outside the Toronto area, please let us know where you're from. So our next Recreational Astronomy Night, like I said, is in two weeks on the 6th of April at 7.30 p.m. here at, on YouTube. Andy Beaton will be discussing the sky this month. Tim Desset will be talking about the Celestron StarSense Explorer telescopes and software. And we still have one open slot uh, for a presentation. So if you've got something you'd like to present, please contact Paul Markov. Our next speaker's night is on the 20th of April, 7.30 p.m. Dr. Carl E. Fields will be discussing the remarkable death of a massive star. Coming up at the David Dunham Observatory on the 27th of March, 12.30 p.m. is Sunday Stargazing. Uh, there's a $6.78 registration fee. Links to that can be found at raskto.ca. Uh, we've got our first light program starting up in uh, starting next week. Uh, if you've joined RASC, the Toronto Centre, in the past year and haven't had a chance to attend an orientation get-together, we'd like to welcome you to the club and uh, provide some info on what we do and what are the opportunities. Um, we're going to give you a chance to get started with some observing, some learning, and some sharing and enjoying of astronomy. So the main topics will be orientation to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre activities, astronomy on a budget, astrophotography, and the certificate programs. Uh, this is free. It's spread over three nights, March 22nd, March 29th, and April 5th, 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, it's free, but it's members only. Uh, you can register online at rasco.ca. Uh, a little bit more about their observing certificate program that the RASC offers. We've got a number of them uh, dealing with a large number of topics observing through your telescope all across the types of objects across the sky. We have our Explore the Universe certificate. We have the Explore the Moon binoculars or telescopes, the Messier catalog, the finest new general catalog objects, double stars, the Isabel Williamson lunar certificate, deep sky gems, and deep sky challenge. 
more details on these, including uh, what's involved and how to apply for a finish certificate, are available at www.rasc.ca slash certificate dash programs. Observing sessions are still suspended until further notice at Baby Village Park, the Long Sioux Conservation Area, and the Ontario Science Center. The CAO is open, however, the road is still closed because of snow and um, because of uh, poor road conditions as a result of snow melting. Um, if you're still interested, however, in visiting the CAO, please read the website in full before making your booking. Access is currently uh, limited due to the pandemic restrictions. Uh, the observing committee is looking for some assistance, specifically a new chair. Uh, the duties involved are uh, operating dark sky sessions at the Long Sioux and Glen Major uh, Forest, as well as the city sessions at Bayview Village Park. Um, in the past, we've had a large team that was involved and helped to divvy up the work. Uh, the chair makes our weather-related go or no-go announcements. Uh, to whether or not the uh, session is going to actually happen. Um, our chair also handles the meet and greet on the night of, and then offer, writes up a quick report uh, on the events for the Toronto Centre the day after. Um, and we are hoping that Centre Observing Activities will start up fairly soon. Uh, please contact myself at president at rasto.ca if you're interested. Similarly, we have some other jobs on our job board that we could uh, use some help with. Our Light Pollution Committee uh, we're Chair, we're looking for a Light Pollution Committee Chair. Um, we're also looking for a Marketing Committee Chair and Committee members. The AV Committee is always looking for additional help. Our Education and Public Outreach Committee is looking for additional support, as well as any telescope camera uh, operators who can help out our visual, our virtual star parties. Again, please drop myself a line. Um, this is where I get to plug the benefits of RASC membership. Uh, you can renew online at secure.rask.ca. Uh, if COVID has thrown some financial difficulties towards you and you're wondering if you can afford to renew your membership, uh, please be advised that the RASC does have an emergency fund for such events. It's completely confidential. Full details are available at mempub at rask.ca. Uh, it's also where you can purchase uh, gift memberships. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a pleasant evening. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all forms of social media we've got listed here. If you liked what you saw tonight, please uh, subscribe, like, hit the notification bell. Stay safe and keep looking up. Good night, everybody.